Hi, AP Stat students. We're going to wrap up our section on experiments. Now, just a little recap from our last video. We were talking about completely randomized designs. They are going to be our simplest statistical designs for experiments, but there are going to be times when the simplest method doesn't yield the most precise results. So when a population consists of groups of individuals that are similar within, but different between, um, then we use like a stratified random sample to get a better estimate than a simple random sample. This same logic is going to apply in our experiments. So instead of a completely randomized design, we're going to use a randomized block design. By block, I mean a group of experimental units that are known before the experiment to be similar in some way that is expected to affect the response to the treatments. This sounds a lot like strata, back when we did stratified random sampling. Similar idea, but the wording is different because that was for sampling and this is for experiments. So if you can divide them into blocks, uh, then you would do a randomized block design. And that, in that case, the random assignment of the units to the treatments is carried out separately within each block. Now, why would we do this? This allows us to account for the variation in the response that is due to the blocking variable. Okay, this makes it easier to determine if one treatment is really more effective than the other. When our blocks are formed wisely, it is easier to find convincing evidence that one treatment is more effective than the other. Okay, so we want to pick these blocks um, if it's obvious to us. If there's nothing obvious as far as, you know, what might affect our results, then don't block. But if you think, oh, this is going to have a big effect, then you're going to block. So, for example, when determining if a detergent cleans clothing better in cold or hot water, it is known that light and dark, light and dark fabrics are affected differently. Uh, this is why, you know, some people say like, oh, like when you do your laundry, you it's short, sorted into lights and darks. I live on the edge and I don't, but that's just me. Uh, the experiment below shows a randomized block design because the randomization occurs after the blocks are separated. So if you'll notice, we put them, you know, with lots of dirty laundry and then we purposely put them into blocks. This is not random. The blocking part is not random. But then each block is randomly assigned to one of the treatments. So you notice the light colored clothing is randomly assigned to cold or hot water, and then the dark colored clothing is randomly assigned to cold or hot water. From there, you would compare the cleanliness um, within the blocks, and then you can also compare it overall when you're done. Let's look at another example. A popcorn lover wants to know if it is better to use the popcorn button on her microwave or use the amount of time recommended on the bag of popcorn. I always think it's hilarious that those popcorn bags say, don't use the popcorn button on the microwave, and yet every microwave has that button. Y'all, they need to get together and chat. Now, to measure how well each method works, she's going to count the number of unpopped kernels remaining after popping. She goes to the store and buys 10 bags of four different varieties of microwave popcorn. She's got movie butter, she's got light butter, she's got natural and kettle corn, um, and she has a total of 40 bags. We're going to explain why a randomized block design might be preferable, 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 same thing, to a completely randomized design for this experiment, and then we're going to do an outline. Now remember, an outline uh, for AP or for a test is not going to give you the full credit, but for our purposes here, we just want a little, um, a picture to kind of get us started. So the completely randomized design is going to ignore the differences between the four types of popcorn which will probably result in a great deal of variability in the number of unpopped kernels for both treatments. So a randomized block design considers uh, each variety of popcorn separately, which allows us to account for the variability in the number of unpopped kernels created by the difference in varieties. So again, the big reason we do this, it allows us to account for the variability created by the differences in these blocks. Uh, let's Actually, instead of just giving a picture, let's actually show. What, what are we going to do? Write it all out. We're going to separate the popcorn into the four different varieties. Movie butter, light butter, natural, and kettle corn. Okay, these are going to be our blocks. Then we're going to randomly assign five bags of each variety to the two treatments. Uh, the popcorn button or the amount of time recommended on the bag. For the random assignment, you, we can place all ten bags of particular popcorn variety in a large bag. Shake and then choose five randomly for the popcorn button. The remaining five bags will be popped using the bag instructions. Repeat the process with all varieties of popcorn. And at the end, count the number of unpopped kernels in each bag 
and compare results with each variety. Combine your results from the four varieties after accounting for the difference in the average response for each variety of popcorn. All right. One more example, and I want you to actually pause this video and try it on your own. Um, I'll let you read it, and then when you unpause, we can see our answers together. So pause this and try it on your own. Okay. Describe a randomized block design. Justify your choice of blocks. We're going to form blocks based on grade level because the scores on the geometry final exam are likely to vary by grade level. Okay? Freshmen taking geometry tend to be more advanced in their math coursework and would likely have a higher final exam score. Uh, randomly assign 50 of the freshmen to take the online geometry course and 50 of the freshmen to take the course taught by the teacher. Randomly assign 200 of the sophomores to take the online geometry course and then 200 of the sophomores to take the geometry course taught by a teacher. And then why would a randomized block design be preferable to a completely randomized design? Well, a randomized block design accounts for the variability in the scores on the geometry final exam created by the different grade levels. This makes it easy to determine which learning format is more effective for increasing scores on the geometry final exam. So kind of get this idea of why we might prefer the block design, right? Because it accounts for this variability in our response that's created by these blocks. Biggest thing I need to caution you about here, please don't mix the language of experiments and the language of sample surveys or other observational studies. You're going to lose credit for saying things like, use a random block design to select the sample, or the experiment suffers from non-response bias because some subjects dropped out. We don't want to confuse our sampling terms with our experiment terms. So a lot of people confuse stratified random sampling with randomized block design. They do seem similar, but they have different names and they're used for different purposes. So try to keep those straight. Now, a special type of randomized block design is going to be a matched pairs design. So a matched pairs design is a common experimental design when you're comparing just two treatments that uses blocks of size two. So again, you're purposely blocking, but each block only has two things in it. Uh, so there's a couple options on how to do this. In some matched pairs design, you're either going to have two very similar experimental units that are paired together, and the two treatments are randomly assigned within each pair. Uh, in others, each experimental unit receives both of the treatments in a random order. Uh, make sure that you realize that randomizing the order of the treatments is important in order to avoid confounding. The main idea or purpose of this is to create blocks by matching pairs of similar experimental units. Just as with other forms of blocking, matching helps account for the variation due to the variables used to form the pairs. So let's go through a couple examples of when you might use or see a matched pairs design. Think about tire wear for your car, right? Tire wear and tear. Uh, if you wanted to test, you know, two different tires to see how well they hold up, you could put one set of tires on the left side of the car and a different set of tires on the right side of the car. So this would help control that, like, confounding variable of different driving styles, right? Teenagers versus seniors and, like, how many miles they drive. It's on the same car, so it's going the same number of miles, being driven by the same person, but you can see the left versus the right. Uh, you could do like a pre and a post test to compare yourself, right? You know, how stressed do you feel, pre-test, post-test, I don't know. Uh, you could do it on this, the same person on two different days. Uh, if you were doing, I don't know, like testing like a, a lotion uh, versus a new lotion, you could use the same person, put one on their right arm, one on their left arm, same skin, same person, same reaction. Uh, this is also a really popular thing to do with twins, right? Two very similar people. Uh, you can do it in other ways, even if they're not twins. Um, perhaps if you wanted to do it like in a classroom or in a school and you're worried about like, you know, intelligence affecting it, pick two people with like the same GPA, have them be a pair. Another two people have the same GPA, have them be a pair, and then randomly assign them to whatever your treatment is. Here's a quick example. A track coach wants to know whether his long-distance runners are faster running the track clockwise or counterclockwise. Design an experiment that uses a matched pairs design to investigate this question. Explain your method of pairing. So think this through for a second. What could we do? So we could have each long-distance runner 
race one mile in each direction, right? Um, some runners are gonna be faster than others, so using each runner as his or her own pair accounts for the variation in the one mile race times among the runners. So for each runner, randomly assign the order in which the treatments, you know, running clockwise or counterclockwise are assigned. You can do this by flipping a coin. It's okay to use flipping a coin here. Uh, heads indicates the runner will race clockwise first, counterclockwise second, second, and then tails is vice versa. You should make sure you allow for adequate recovery time between the races, um, and then for each runner, record the one mile race times for each direction. So this way, they're serving as their own um, comparison here, but you are comparing each person to themselves. All right, this wraps up our section on experiments. There were lots of learning targets in this section, uh, including talking about confounding, observational studies versus experiments, explanatory and response, units and treatments. We talked about the placebo effect and the purpose of blinding. We talked about how do you randomly assign. We talked about the purposes of the four experimental principles, comparison, random assignment, control, and replication. That's a really big one. Describe a completely randomized design and then also describe a randomized block design as well as a mesh pairs design. And then why would we block? Uh, make sure you do lots of practice on this section. It's lots of writing and lots of vocabulary. So maybe make some note cards for yourself. Check out your textbook for more examples um, and then ask any questions in class. All right, guys, happy studying.